Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Randy had a story. I'm going to give you a brief story. But mine's a little different than Randy's. Uh, I kind of tried to do my own thing. You know, I, tried to, I didn't try to get a job at ICR. I read ICR's books, and I went to school as a geologist. I heard Dwayne Gish speak when I was an undergraduate at Western Michigan. And he said, stay low. You know, don't make a big deal out of it. Go to school. Learn your stuff. And, but he never promised me a job or anything. I never asked for a job with those guys. I was going to go into oil and gas make my money in oil and gas. So I went off to Wyoming and got my master's. I went to Western Michigan for my undergrad, Wyoming for my master's. They're both brown and gold W's. It was easier. And they weren't any good at sports. So we could, you know, study as opposed to watching the football games. It was kind of nice. If you go to a school that's really good in sports, you feel like you've got to go to the game. So I recommend going to schools that aren't that good at sports. <laughs> but it just worked out that way. But then I, I had no dreams, no thoughts of going back for my PhD. But God had other plans. And God you know, said, okay, you've done your eight and a half years with, with Chevron as an oil and gas geologist. You've learned enough. I'm going to move you on. And I, you know, for years, I just struggled. Why did I get laid off? Why, did I get, well, you know, why me? Why not somebody else? Why not these other guys? And there, a bunch of us got laid off that year. Chevron cut 60% of their staff. And a lot of the other companies did the same thing. So a lot of us ended up back at Western Michigan because they had a, a second master's program. We could go into hydrogeology. So I went back to my old undergraduate school. They took me and said, yeah, we remember you. And we'll take care of you. We'll give you some money. And Chevron gave some money. And so part of the severance package was a pretty good deal. But I had no, you know, other than that, I would never have gone back for my PhD. And I stuck around and said, I'll get a PhD while I'm at it. Little did I know that that was all part of God's plan. That I learned oil and gas skills. Things I'm going to talk about tonight are essential to have those skills to do what I'm doing. And academia doesn't teach you the stuff you learn in the industry. And so industry really helped a lot, but I had no ideas, no thoughts, no... I was tired of school after my master's. How many people get tired of school? Tired of school? Some of you are still in grade school. You probably shouldn't raise your hand. But after six years of going to, you know, learning geology, I was tired of it, and I went and worked in oil and gas. That's what I was going to do. But God had other plans. So at age 52, after I, and I even I taught in Michigan for years at a college. At age 52, God called me to ICR. I've been doing some research with them and things, and finally I said, you know, I'm ready to take that step. God kind of encouraged me to go along. You know, I was getting into things I shouldn't have gotten my, getting myself into, living too secular of a life. And God pulled me out of that and said, here, you're going to ICR. And so without the PhD, I wouldn't have ever got hired at ICR. You know, but God, I never wanted to get a PhD. But it was really essential for the research that I'm doing as well to, to be able to go, you know, you have to kind of really be a self-starter, and the PhD really teaches you how to do that. And so it was, it was uh, kind of like Moses. You know, I was just out there wandering around in the wilderness, living for years, living, living my own life. And God finally said, okay, it's time we're going to use you. And now I'm doing the greatest research I've ever done in my life. It's the most fulfilling research. It's showing people like yourselves that God's word is true. Every word of God's word is true. And there's not one part that's wrong. There really was a global flood. And that's what I get to share with you tonight. I get to share that there really was a global flood. And the research that I'm doing is, has never been done, probably to the extent that it's being done that I'm working on. I've got four continents done. I'll show you some of the results. We're going continent by continent, plotting up the rock data. And this is was, you know, maybe done 50 years ago, but they didn't have near the data set, nor the drilling offshore that we have now. And so we're able to access a lot of this data. A lot of it gets published, and I put this into into this research. And after six years or so of doing this research, you get to see the results. And some of this is on display in Dallas if you ever get down that way. But I wouldn't recommend coming this month. It's still too warm. It's 103 degrees today down in Irving, Texas, where I live. 103 is a little hot. And uh, being, being a, you know, a native of Michigan, I'm more used to this kind of weather. And so I feel right at home here. It really looks like Michigan around here where I'm from. So, uh-oh, we lost it. There it is. It's back. Let me go back one more spot. So anyway, I want to thank my co-author, Davis J. Warner. That's a, a student who actually comes in and works on all the maps for me. And he's really, really helpful. And unfortunately, that's not even his real name because we don't want to out him. So if he goes off to graduate school somewhere and people Google people's names, that they won't know who he really is. And that was the advice of Dwayne Gish, and it worked pretty well. But I want to talk about the flood and how it really was a global flood. And that's what I spend most of my time on. People doubt and people tell you all the time, like Randy said, Princeton's here in this state, I guess. That's why we're picking on Princeton. Now, I had a professor at Wyoming from Princeton. He was really tough. He was a tough professor. But anyway, there really was a flood. 
and you'll see why. But people doubt that all the time. They always try to make it a local flood, just the Black Sea. Even the geologists that believe in a flood believe it's just a local flood. I didn't know one college professor that believed in a global flood. They all believed the secular lies that they were taught, and that they were taught, and they were taught. And everybody just accepts these millions of years as if they're real. That's another whole talk, but there's a lot that's just accepted because that's what's taught. Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. People start to believe it. And unfortunately, that's where we are in secular science, particularly in geology. And I'm trying to break through some of that by doing the research that I'm doing to show what the rocks really show. Not what people say, but what the rocks really show. And unfortunately, a lot of our evangelical leaders in our seminaries have kind of bowed down to what Darwin's taught, bowed down to the secular science. The people that developed the whole alternative story to the story of creation that's written down in our Bible that is true, they developed their own story. And they convinced people that that's science. And unfortunately, a lot of your church leaders teach the same things. Like Randy said, it's hard to tell the difference between an old earth person and a young earth person is completely different. Old earth basically teaches evolution. A lot of our Christian colleges teach evolution. And they use this, of course, this big chart to show all the fossils and how everything evolved. Start down here, we evolved from marine critters. But we're going to see in my research that, of course, marine animals were buried first. That's the way the flood progressed. As the flood went higher, you buried different things, more and more land. But all throughout, there's marine animals. This is the most neglected part of the fossil column is over here. With T-Rexes, they find six species of sharks in the same rock layers. Six species. It used to be five. They just found a sixth one. So there's always marine mixing going on. We'll talk a little bit more about that. To me, all these things indicate you had to have mixing because you were bringing in ocean water and these tsunami-like waves all the way from the ocean onto the land and eventually covered the whole land, as we'll see. So don't let these things intimidate you. Besides, like Randy said, nothing shows any evolution anyway. We just see things showing up, fully formed. And then above that, there's something else fully formed, fully formed, fully formed. And there's no ancestors or descendants to anything. And you can ask the evolutionists that. They'll admit it. If you push it to them, don't let them get out of the room, they'll have to say, okay, we have nothing. We have no ancestors to any dinosaurs. We have no descendants to any dinosaurs, let alone dinosaurs turning into birds. That's another story. Second Peter 3, God told Peter to write this, There should come the last day scoffers walking after their own lusts. But they are willingly ignorant. Science today is willingly ignorant of what God's word says. And of the rock, what the rocks show. Because they've never looked at the rocks the way I'm looking at it and the way you're going to see them tonight. And that by the word of God, the heavens are bold, the earth stand out of water, in the water. And the last phrase says, Whereby the world that then was, the pre-flood world here, the world that then was, being overflowed with the water, perished. So the pre-flood world was overflowed with water, and it perished. We should see some evidence for that. If the whole world was flooded, you should see some evidence of that. And I tell people all the time, just look down. Because most people live where there's sedimentary rocks. And we'll see that's what the flood left behind. Evolutionists, unfortunately, deny the truth, the truth of God's word. And they don't want to look at the rocks. They don't spend the time looking at the rocks like I do. God's word says, Thy word is true from the beginning. So the very first verse of the Bible, it doesn't start in Matthew. It doesn't start just in the New Testament. It's the Old Testament. It starts with the book of Genesis. It doesn't start in the book of Judges or the book of Ruth. The truth of God's word starts with Genesis 1.1, where he tells us how he created everything. He just spoke it into existence. So we're going to look at three truths of the flood in my talk. And the first one I'll spend most of the time on kind of like Randy, but we're doing question one first, not three first, is, but these are just truths. So I'm going to show you the facts behind this, is the rocks. The global flood, there was a global flood. Secondly, it was a catastrophic flood. It wasn't a tranquil flood. It isn't like filling your bathtub up and water comes up slowly. These are very violent waves that whipped across the surface. And you see the evidence of that. And finally, it was a recent flood. This flood didn't happen millions of years ago, or even... 10,000 years ago. It happened about 4,500 years ago, just like the Bible genealogies tell us. So give or take a few years, but not many years. So even the secular scientists believe in global floods. They just don't believe it flooded everything. They believe there was some global effect. They do see that in the rocks. So this is in North America during the first flooding episode. 
which is kind of the Cambrian or Ordovician, if you're familiar with those terms. And here's the second flood, the third flood, the fourth flood, the fifth. And finally, the sixth flood is the least extent. But we'll talk about these things. These are really, I'm going to look at these sequences as chapters of the flood. And they're all listed over here, these six floodings. They use Native American tribe names. The guy that named these in the 1960s, uh, Lawrence Sloss. These are the more familiar names that most people have. This is the psychic chart with the millions of years, et cetera. So down here in the Cambrian Ordovician is the sequence called the Sauk, Sauk Native Tribe. And then above that, you get the Tippecanoe and the Kaskaskia and the Abzerica. And finally, the Zuni and the Tejas. So some of you might be familiar with some of these tribes that lived around here. Tippecanoe, is that in this area? Tippecanoe, New York, maybe? Socks from Wisconsin, they used to live there. But anyway, he used Native American names because he wanted to differentiate these from these other names that are mostly tribes of people that lived in Europe, where the geologic sort of column came from. So these are big pulses of sediment. So this idea is a sock came in and flooded the land and backed off, and the Tippecanoe came in and flooded the land and backed off, and the Cascades came and flooded the land and backed off. But it never flooded everything. Because they, don't ever, they don't want to believe that. And then finally, there's a big flooding at the end. The flooded, you know, the Zuni went up and then it went back down. So this is modern-day sea level here in the middle, and this is supposed to show several hundred meters higher, several hundred meters lower, et cetera. But they believe, of course, this took place over millions of years, but they do see evidence of water-deposited sediments globally. But they don't quite look to the full extent. They look here, they look there, they don't put it all together. So I believe these are actually episodes of the flood. All took place in one year's time. There's no evidence of time in between these layers like they try to put in there. They need that time so they can pretend evolution might actually have occurred. You can't actually have evolution without time. Because you've got to have all this, well, what if you have enough time, this could happen. Like Randy talks about, if you have enough time, you're going to build a Volvo, Volvo car right in front of you. Yeah, you know that's not going to happen. But that's what they believe. All these parts working together suddenly just started working. But you give it enough time, they argue that, but I don't believe there is enough time. You only have the one year of the flood for most of the sediments. And so we're going to look at tonight data-driven science, which is opposite the way science is done. Most people do verification science, where they already know the answer. They'll just go out there to prove it. So they already know we evolved. Let's go find evidence of evolution. We already know dinosaurs turned into birds, so therefore let's go find dinosaurs and birds. And sometimes they find hoaxes, where they glue them together. So that's the way most science is done, sadly. But I'm going to look at the data. When I came to ICR, they said, start working on geologic columns, stratigraphic columns. And I said, oh, I'm going to start plotting them up and see where it goes. So I started plotting across the United States. And then I went to Canada. And I went to South America, Mexico, and Central America. I went to Africa. started plotting all this data up. And I started seeing patterns coming out. That's observable data. The rocks are really what's there. So if you drilled a well right here all the way down to the crust, you know, that's the kind of data point we have for New Jersey. They've got points in New Jersey, points in every state. And so we're going to look at observable data, and I'm going to assume, which I think is a safe assumption, that the Bible is also 100% true, that there really was a global flood. But let's look and see what the rocks show. So I've got over 2,000 of these stratigraphic columns now from actual rock data. And I used about 16 basic rock types. You know, there's more than that. If you go into geology, you'll know there's you know, 100 and some types of rocks, and you'll learn most of them at some point. And you forget most of them, but these are the, the simple ones, just like you learn a bunch of minerals and you forget most of those too. And these are those sequences, or mega sequences, because the names of sequences have gotten so big, they now have to refer to these original sequences as mega sequences, because they're the biggest. And so these are big, huge packages of sediment that came in, and then the waves backed off a little bit, just like tsunami waves come in, and they go back. They come in and they go back. And so there's big packages of rock that we can identify where big, huge sequences came in across the continents and backed off. So I keep track of those in addition to what rocks are there. And this is from the Michigan Basin. It's got 5,000 meters or more of sediment and the different rock types in here, different sequences. Not every sequence is everywhere, but some of them are. So let's look at the flood. What's the Bible say first? We'll start with the Bible in every case because God does lay out the general order of what happened in the flood. And the first thing he says is the fountains of the deep burst on day one. In the 600 year of Noah's life, where all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And unfortunately, a lot of people stop here, including my college students that I teach occasionally. They believe the flood was only 40 days. The flood was not 40 days. It rained really hard for 40 days. 
And if you keep reading, you'll find out the flood was almost a year. They were on the ark over a year, but the flood lasted at least 314 days. And they got off the ark 371 days into it. But here, the first thing that breaks open is all these rifts break open all over the earth. And the earth is the only planet in our solar system that actually has tectonic plates. Hear about plate tectonics, how the plates moved around? Earth's unique. It's the only planet that has those. But I believe this is when God created those plates. He burst all these rifts all over the earth and started the boundaries of these plates. And then they started to move because they're unstable. They're very cool and very dense at the surface. And they started to sink into the hot, less dense mantle. And down the subduction began. The fountains of the deep burst in the oceans. And then we started seeing these, which I believe up to maybe day 40 of the flood, chapters 1 to 3, the Sock, the Tippecanoe, the Kaskaskia. There'll be a quiz on these later, too. Okay, so some of you in the back can't read those. You're going to be in trouble. Uh, but these first three are very, very similar. I believe this is day 40, and we'll see why I'm at the Sock through Kaskaskia. And you have these huge tsunami-like waves. This is the one from Japan. But you've got to imagine tsunami waves bigger than anything we've ever witnessed in historic times. Waves bigger than you can imagine almost, maybe 1,000 foot high, maybe more, 1,500 foot high waves sweeping across the continents. And the continents didn't have the big mountains we have today. They just had high hills. And so we see the evidence of this in the rocks because, again, the rocks don't lie. People do. So this is one sandstone, this yellow layer. This is the United States down here, New Jersey's over here. Michigan, Texas, you know, this whole area, there's one big, huge sandstone that blankets most of the 48 states, a little bit up here in Canada even. And there was no West Coast at the time. There was no California. That kind of added on during the flood as you kind of subducted more material. You, California is really made out of the material that was in the bottom of the ocean and got smeared on. So that made the West Coast. So the geology in California is really screwed up. And I think that explains a lot. But that's another problem. When I get to California, I've got to watch that joke. But it's true. It really is messed up. Now, anyway, down the middle, it's very thin. But blanket sands are a problem for geologists, secular geologists, you know, people at the universities, because they can't explain the same exact sandstone, which may only be as thick as this room, that covers almost the entire United States. And there's always papers trying to explain blanket sands. How do you get a blanket sand? Because you have to have a river that moves across that entire area over millions of years, but rivers leave a lot of clay behind. They just have sand channels here and there. You don't see just pure sand spread across that vast of an area. That's the very first layer that was deposited in North America was a sandstone layer. The flood waters came across the land. And here we can go to Michigan, you go to the Pitcher Rocks up on Lake Superior, and you can go to Grand Canyon, you can look at the same rock layers because it's the same sandstone down here in Grand Canyon all the way up in Michigan. And it's even here. And then we can go to the Kaskaskia, two sequences up. We can see this blue now is all limestone. So those of you unfamiliar with geology, we color sandstones yellow. We color limestones blue. This is all one big, huge limestone. This is the red wall limestone in Grand Canyon. It's the same limestones up where Randy lives up in the Black Hills. What was the name of it? Pahasapa limestone, I believe it is. The names change because different geologists in different states named them, and they realize this is all the same. Plot up all this data. You see this all one big limestone all the way across from here to here. How do you get a blanket limestone? How do you get a blanket sand? Unless you have a, one layer that's spread across that whole thing, leaving that deposit behind. Pure limestone, sometimes 800 feet thick, spread across that whole area. And you look at the fossils in these first sequences, the Sauk, Tepic, and Kaskaskia, we see almost all marine critters. So it isn't that we evolved from marine critters, it was just flooding marine areas first. And we'll come back to that later. So here you see that these are actual photos taken of museums. Okay, they're not, they're, we didn't go back in time. They're actual photos taken from museum specimens like the Field Museum in Chicago showing the Sauk fossils. Tippecanoe fossils, Kaskaskia fossils, they're all showing shallow marine. So there's almost no land animals or anything yet. Now let's move on to the next chapters. At this point in the flood, you may be 40 days into it, and the people that didn't get on the ark are starting to feel like, hmm, the water's getting higher. 40 days and there's still probably no flooding of the land. But the Bible tells us on day 40, the ark starts to float, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth, the waters increased and bear up the ark. 
here we are in day 40, day 41, the ark starts to float. So now we know we're flooding land. And the waters increased to bear up the ark, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And I believe that was about day 150 of the flood, as you keep reading the narration. So the waters increased until about day 150. And God's telling us here, increased, prevailed, increased greatly, prevailed exceedingly. As Randy said, if you read this the way it's written, as historical narrative, it's just telling you the water got higher, got higher, got higher, got higher yet, until it went over the top of the highest hill. And that's what we see in the rock record. We go up to the Absarica. Now, this is the big turning point in the flood. If you're a human or an animal on the land, you've got to watch out now. It's starting to come on the land. You've got to remember only eight people got on the ark. Only eight people believed Noah, count himself. So seven people believed Noah. Eight people believed that God told Noah there was going to be a flood. There's millions, if not maybe billion people on the earth in 1,600 years, and only eight people believed. The door was open for 100 years or so while he was building the ark. You know, there were a lot of people at this point in the flood were starting to regret that they didn't get on the ark now the water is starting to encroach on the land. First 40 days, it stayed maybe in the shallow seas. But by day 40, it starts to flood the land. The ark starts to float. And they're going, hmm, maybe we should have listened to Noah. But it's too late. The door was shut by God himself. But we have hope for salvation today. That was salvation back then was the ark. It was covered with kofir, with a covering to cover the sins of man. Today we have the perfect Redemption through Christ's blood. And that door is open. The door is open for us just to believe. Just like walking through the door of the ark, we can have salvation if we believe in Christ. You know, the ark really is a, a, a version of Christ. It saved him from the judgment of the flood. But only eight people believed. And today, of all the billions of people on the earth, you know, there won't be just eight of us, of course, but there's a lot less than there should be that believe in Christ. And part of it's because they're believing the lies spread by science. Even well-meaning Christians get caught up in it. They become old earth geologists, which is what most of my geology colleagues are. If they believe in God, they're old earth geologists. They just can't get around those millions of years. But we'll see the flood doesn't talk millions of years. It just shows rocks. And when we go to the Absarica, things get bad. The ark starts to float. And you start depositing sediment. Now, this is a thickness map. Areas in white, there are no sediments from that particular interval. But here you can see most of the United States is now covered from the west. We're starting to subduct in the west. And sediments are coming from the west. The areas in green are about three kilometers thick. That's about two miles of you and me. And so this area gets flooded in New Jersey. There's a bit getting some over here. But everything in here is still high and dry. And you have the splitting of the continents taking place in the Absarica. It's not a coincidence that everything really bad starts happening in the Absarica. And so these sequences start to split up, and you create a whole new ocean crust. All these colors on here is the ocean crust age. And the ocean crust in blue, the oldest crust here, up against the east coast, just offshore here, and across Africa where they split apart, where you were attached to Africa at one point. Is that split apart? This is when it began. This is when those plates really started to move. The oldest ocean only goes back to the Absarica sequence. Continents are much older. They go back to creation week, but the ocean turned over completely. Catastrophic plate tectonics was going on in the flood. And they're still very young. These red areas are very young. And you have all these coal beds that were deposited in the flood as well. This is where they start, the Pennsylvanian coals. The West Virginian coals all were deposited in the Absarica sequence. Later, we have other coals in Wyoming that are up to 85 to maybe even 200 foot thick. 200 foot thick coal seams that happen later in the flood. But all this stuff happens at once because you're now flooding the land. And you get land animals that are showing up in the rock record in great numbers. And you get coal. All these things happen at once because that's what was being flooded. It's not a coincidence that the oceans turned over because as the oceans created more crust, they pushed the water up from below. Because that new crust was hot, like a hot air balloon, it pushes up from below. So when you push the bottom of your bathtub up, what's going to happen to the water? It's going to go higher and spill over the top. And that's exactly what happens. So the more crust you made, the more the water went higher and higher and higher. Eventually it started flooding. Eventually it went over the top. And here we have the top. 
This is the Zuni, which is the high point of the flood in most of the continents I'm studying. See these little red blue dots up here? Blue dots, blue dots. That's the bathtub ring. We're talking about if you get dirty or you're hoeing beans, like I used to do as a kid, we take a bath, we leave a bathtub ring around the bathtub. Shows you the high level of the water. Well, here's the high level of the water. Went over the top of the highest hill. These are drilled by, the Canadians drilled some wells in the Hudson Bay. They left some Zuni sediments. These are Cretaceous and Jurassic sediments. We see those across Michigan as well. So the, to get sediments there, they can't just fly in. You don't just drop them off an airplane. These had to be continuous. It's just that much of it eroded away and left these little remnants behind. So to me, this is the evidence that the flood really did cover everything. And you see this on other continents as well. We see these little remnants. You couldn't get there any other way unless you had a more extensive flooding that took place. If we look at the Apsaracans, do the fossils again? We find the dinosaurs, we find reptiles, we find insects, we find all these marine fossils mixed in with them, like I talked about earlier. That's universal. The Europeans even find dinosaurs in marine rocks. They thought that was the exception. A couple years ago, they published a big paper online that said, no, nope, that's the rule. Most of our dinosaurs are found in limestone and chalk, things that only form in the oceans. How do you get dinosaurs in limestone and chalk? Even the Pluxy dinosaur footprints down by Glen Rose, Texas, south of Dallas, their footprints are in limestone. That's ocean sediment. And there's even a dinosaur I wrote about in one of the Acts and Facts articles where they found a dinosaur 70 miles offshore Norway in the North Sea, one and a half miles down in an oil well. They got washed offshore, and the marine animals got washed onshore. There was tremendous movements of those waves going in and out as they washed back and forth as they eventually went over the top. And you can see here's the proportion of fossils. This is from the paleobiology database. You guys can go home and look that up, paleobiology org, I think it is. Do a Google search. You can do this yourself. These are all the phyla of, of animals in their early sequences. Sock, Tippic, and New Kaskaskia, they're all marine. Everything in blue is marine. There's almost no land animals and no coal until you hit the Carboniferous, which is the beginning of the Absarica. The Pennsylvanian. And you start to see land animals in red showing up in greater and greater numbers as you flooded more and more land. More and more environments were flooded but you're always mixing them with marine. See all those blue ones? You never get rid of the blue. It's not as simple as they make it out to be in your historical geology class. And we see mixing of land and marine and coal. We see dinosaurs, land and marine and coal. We see marine critters washed all the way over up to North Dakota. We see mosasaurs in Kansas. How those things get in there? The water had to rise that high, push them across the top. And then eventually God remember Noah. He remembered his promises and his, his receding water. The water finally went down about day 150. The water reached its peak, the ark grounds, and the water starts to go down. But it takes a long time for the water to go down because floods take a long time. Water goes up, it takes a long time to go down. God made a wind to pass over the earth, the Bible says, and the waters assuaged. It means it kind of went back and forth, just like tsunami waves do. Fountains of the deep, windows of heaven were stopped, the rain of heaven was restrained, Waters returned from off the earth continually at the end of 150 days. The waters were abated. So they reached the high point at day 150, and then they started going down. And what happens there is a new crust. This is a secular diagram here. They believe the floodings took place because sea level went up and down like the earth was breathing. Faster spreading rates pushed more of the water up, like I mentioned earlier. But we see a progressive flooding. We don't see it going up and down as much. But as the ocean crust cooled, it got more dense, and it sank. I used to tell my students, you know, I'm cold and old and more dense. You guys are young, and I usually couldn't say young and hot because I get in trouble. But, you know, young, hot things, hot, new crust is still hot. And as it cools, it sinks and moves away. And that's why the oceans get deeper away from these ridges. The ridges are still very hot today. They're still residual leftovers from the flood. But they're not moving very fast today. They're moving this much a year. In the flood, they're moving miles per hour, meters per Second, fly it right along. And so you made this whole new ocean crust, and as it started to cool, it started to pull down and pull the water off the land, but it took a long time for that to happen. It took a half a year. So here's the Tejas, which is the receding phase, and most of the sediment on here washed off into the Gulf of Mexico. See how green it is? That means it's really thick, thousands of feet thick. You've got the Cascades over here forming at this time. Most of the volcanoes in the world 
Most of the mountains in the world, 80% of the world's mountains all form at this time. Because of all that turmoil that went on inside the mantle, now things are trying to equilibrate after all that movement. Now all these mountains are rising. The Rockies rose up and poked through. The Andes formed, the Himalayas, the Alps all form at the same time. Most of the mountain ranges all form at this point. And the water is draining off, draining off, draining off. And we see mostly mammals and marine critters. Don't forget the marine critters. Mostly mammals and marine critters. Well, why do we see mostly mammals and not dinosaurs? Because I think they lived at higher elevation. It's all about ecological zonation, as we'll see. But let's go back and review. Here's now three continents. And I'll show you a fourth one in a minute. Here's North America. Beginning, this is the sock. There we go to the sock, the very first sequence in South America. You can barely see South America, but that's all that flooded was those blue areas. Very little flooding. Very little flooding across Africa. The sock tip of and Cascascar are almost identical. I could keep showing these, you'd think I didn't even change the slide. Very little flooding taking place on these continents. Most of it's high and dry. You get the same high point of the flood, day 150. Here's the high point, those little points up here. You see those same set of remnants across South America. You see a lot more coverage now. You see Africa, you see a lot more coverage. Now the reason it's not fully covered is because the Bible tells us the highest point of the flood was only 15 cubits over the highest hills. 15 cubits is about 22 feet. So 22 feet doesn't leave a lot of sediment behind. But it does leave some remnants. And so the erosion of you know, what was totally covered, the Bible tells us, we still see indications that it did but it doesn't show it today because it's 4,500 years later. You know, a few feet of sediment doesn't last long. So you've got thousands of feet of sediment, you'll see it. And here's the receding phase. So here's the same thing happening in every continent. Most of the stuff shifting offshore, the big thick areas off the Niger Delta, off the Amazon, in the Gulf. Now you guys might have missed that. Same beginning phase of the flood, minimal flooding early. Same high point of the flood, every continent. Same receding phase of the flood, every continent. And you tell me it's not a global flood. The same exact thing happened in every continent. And the same thing happens in Europe. We just finished Europe. You're one of the first audiences to see Europe's data. Minimal starting of the flood, high point of the flood, receding phase of the flood. Boom, boom, boom. Same story, different continent. I predict in Asia we're going to see the same thing. I predict when I get to Australia I'm going to see the same thing. The pattern is there, it was a global flood. Here's the volumes, because some of you don't believe me. I could show surface area too, but I didn't, because that wastes more time. Here's the volume in North America. Even though there's a lot of coverage, it's very thin. 6%, then more, more, more. 31% all comes in the Zuni, the high point, I believe, of the flood is the brown one. It's even a little more in the receding phase. South America starts there very slow, builds, 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 jumps way up, high point of the flood. Africa. Starts out really slow, very, 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 jumps way up. And it goes down. Europe. Floods a little bit earlier, and it's because more of Europe was a swampy area. They didn't have many high grounds in Europe. Africa had a lot of high ground. North America didn't have, had Canada was the high ground. When you add it all up to all four of these continents, here's what we see. Very consistent pattern. Very little, very little, very little, jumps up, jumps way up, and it goes down. Here's my world totals based on rock type. You can't see the blue as well. But the blue represents limestone, sandstone is yellow, and shale is brown. And red is volcanics. We'll talk more about those tomorrow. In my Ice Age talk, the volcanics are very important while they peak toward the end. This is when Yellowstone's erupting. This is when the Cascades are doing most of the eruptions. All the world's volcanoes are erupting a lot during that last sequence, during the, when the water was receding. And that brought, helped bring on the Ice Age we'll talk about tomorrow. But here's the peak, and you can see the rock types. Shale's the number one rock in the world. Geologists have said that for years, but it's verified by this. So here's my new sea level curve, and I plan on going to GSA, Geological Society of America's annual meeting in about two weeks, and presenting some of this. I can't talk about the flood, but I can show them rocks. I can show them the maps, and I'm going to say, this early flooding we had down here doesn't seem to hold true. Because what do we see? We see this. Very little flooding early, very little flooding, very little, and that jumps up to one peak, just as the Bible describes, one global flood that got higher, increased higher, increased higher, increased higher. God's word is true, and the rocks show it. 
There was one flood. It might have fluctuated a little bit, fluctuated a little bit, fluctuated a little bit, but it reached one high point in that Zuni sequence, and then it went down. That's what the global record shows. This is what the rocks really show. Nobody has this database except the one we're created, ICR. So we're trying to show the geologists at the conferences, and they're going to be like, huh, even the old Earth guys I've talked to about that, we like your data, Tim. We just don't like your interpretation. I said, well, how do you interpret it? When you see the same pattern on every continent, you know, maybe a slight difference or two, but essentially the same pattern on every continent. They all start slow, very minimal, and they increase, increase to a point where they all go down, reach a peak, and then they all go down. You might wonder, how did dinosaurs survive the early flood? Why don't we find those dinosaurs in my, my home state of Michigan? We find some here. New Jersey's got a few. But they survived as long as they could. But we find a lot of our dinosaurs in the American West all straddling this one little location, right? It runs right down the middle of the country. And that's what I call Dinosaur Peninsula. I didn't have New Jersey worked out quite yet because it's collided with Africa over here. But here we see a very thin area of early sediments, those first 40 days, the Sauk, Tippecanoe, and Kaskaskia. There's almost none because that area wasn't underwater yet. The oil wells across Colorado and stuff all show everything thinning dramatically in those early sequences. Grand Canyon's over here. It's in the area where I believe is water. Michigan, my home state's in water. So we find marine fossils there. That was what's flooded first. As the waters came up, it flooded the shallow marine areas first. That's why we see marine fossils first in the rock record. And then later we see marine fossils mixed with land animals as they start to flood the land. And so what we find in Michigan is marine fossils. What we find out west are dinosaurs. What we find up in Canada, well, we don't find these. But we would have, but they got washed off. God wiped off the humans and the mammals probably living up here in what's now Canada and spread them on top. So we find mammals like camels and pigs and cats, and lions, tigers, and bears, all on top of dinosaurs. We don't find lions and tigers and bears with dinosaurs because they live in a different elevation. We find squirrels and beavers with dinosaurs because they like swamps. There's mammals in there. They're just swampy mammals. You know, they don't find the high animals. That we so I believe humans and dinosaurs are living at the same time. They're just different areas. Unless you're a teenage boy showing off for the girls, you probably didn't go into dinosaur areas. Teenage boys would, though. And they didn't come back, most of them. Probably not. So early on, you flood this, then you flood this, then you flood this. And you see a defined order to the fossil record, just like we talked about. Marine fossils first. Swampy things next. Mammals finally at the end. It's all about ecological zonation, over a few thousand feet of elevation, probably. So we put this into a global map. And we predicted what Europe would look like, and we were actually pretty correct. This is our prediction, where we do most of Europe as a swampy area. The dark green is swampy areas where dinosaurs live. Here's Dinosaur Peninsula. We put together our Pangaea, so to speak. Here's these big areas of Africa and South America that didn't flood until very late because they were high ground. Anything light green would be areas where humans were probably living with those, you know, most of the mammals. And so we let this run through and put it on our globe at the Discovery Center down in Dallas. I just started this globe going on September 2nd. The whole museum opened up. Now we have, you can run through the whole flood in two minutes. So we're going to go through some of that as we go along here. So this, we, on our globe, we have day one. It looks something like this. Fountains are bursting all over, these white things. Day 25, you're starting to get a little muddy areas in here as the waves are washing around. Day 40, you're starting to flood a lot more of the land. The dinosaur peninsula is starting to be inundated. And you see the continents are moving because we believe the continents moved mostly under the water. And then day 90, you're starting to get really worried if you're a human, because all that's left pretty much is where you were living. And then day 130, you're really getting worried, probably fighting with people for the last little bit of land. And day 150, every land-dwelling, air-breathing animal that wasn't on the Ark was dead gone. There's no place to go. The waves are so big going across by tsunami like waves. Even people trying to make rafts were turned over and drowned. Everybody that didn't get on the ark, every animal that wasn't chosen by God to be on the ark, that breathed there was dead. And then the land started to come back up. The mountains pop up first. 
And you can see the land starts showing up more and more and more as you go along. Day 314, you have all the land, but no vegetation, really. And by day 371, there's supposed to be a little greening showing up in here. It shows up on our globe. It shows you when they got off the ark. There was food to eat because the grasses and things were starting to grow. No big trees, but they were getting there. So the flood was global. Starts out small in every continent, builds to a peak, same time in every continent, and went down. Let's look quickly at it was a catastrophic flood, not a tranquil flood at all. And then we'll look at a recent flood. When I dug dinosaurs in Wyoming, places you go through, you dig dinosaurs up, you find them in bone beds. With thousands of bones all tore apart. Very rarely do you find a complete specimen. When you find a complete specimen, they're also buried very, very quickly, as we'll see. Uh, but this is the normal way we find dinosaur bones, tore all apart. One species, you know, bone laying on top of another like a log jam. You find land and marine are very common. Here's, you know, land plants. Here's some fish. Here's a dinosaur. Here's a fish. This is a common occurrence. It's not an exception. We see polystrate trees up in the Joggins Cliffs up here in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. You can see these things, polystrate trees. These trees were buried fast enough they didn't rot away. You know, we see the fighting dinosaurs in Mongolia. We have a version of these in our museum in Dallas. These are found by the Mongolians. Notice the arm of the velociraptor is right inside the mouth of the protoceratops. It's about to bite down. You know, it's like a trapped rat. It's about to bite down, and they got buried instantly. It's like two WWE wrestlers going at it, you know, choking them out, and they buried instantly, frozen that way for thousands of years until they dug these guys up. Velociraptors really weren't that big either. They're only about this big. The movies kind of lie to you, in case you didn't notice. They make things that aren't true. Although the T-Rex is probably okay, but most of them are. Anyway, this is a mummified dinosaur. We find these buried so fast, it looks like a dead horse. The skin's still on there. You can still see the scaly skin. You know, dinosaurs are buried rapidly in the flood. They weren't buried slow at all. It's kind of sad, but they were. If you went on the ark by day 150, everything was dead. You see flat planar beds, you go out to Colorado, you can see the same rock units, Grand Canyon, that go for sometimes hundreds of miles in all directions. We see areas that are supposed to have millions of years, or in this case, almost a million years of erosion. There's places in Grand Canyon supposed to be 160 million years of erosion, and they're perfectly flat. Hermit shale, Coconino sandstone. Where's the evidence there was millions of years of time in there? They tell us it's there. As a geologist student, they just say, oh, look, this is, you can touch your hand across a million years, or a billion years, or a half a billion years. And yet, they don't tell people, where's the erosion? They don't want you to question what you're being taught. They just tell you stuff, and everybody believes it. Oh, it's millions of years. Isn't that cool? Well, it might have been a day or two, maybe a week, but it hasn't been millions of years. These are just like bricks laid on the rocks, just like bricks. You can't tell the time between each brick either, but you know there wasn't a lot of time. Or the wall would have fallen over. There should be some erosion, but they're not. So the flood was catastrophic. It buried things rapidly, fast, deep. Life assemblages, as they're called, life position. Tore them apart. And finally, there's evidence in those same rocks that this stuff is recent, not millions of years ago. Go back to the bones. Let's take a look. What do we see since 2005? And actually before, we have found original proteins collagens, osteocyte cells, blood vessels. They're supposed to be 68 million years old and actually older. They've got things now that go back over a half a billion years in their minds. And they're still original, stretchy things, stretchy worm things you can still stretch apart. How can these things be 500 million years old or 68 million years old and still exist? Like they were just buried last week. To me, it's amazing after 4,500 years or so since the flood, these things are still around because they're laying up there at the surface in Montana, freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing. They've cut open these T Rex femurs and they find all this in it. Shocked the world. And they found over, there's been about 100 papers finding more since this 2005 discovery. 100 secular, scientific, peer reviewed papers. More and more and more and more. And yet when I ask people about it, my, my old earth friends, they're like, well, it don't really mean much. I'm like, this is as empirical as it gets. You can keep finding more. Even T-Rex Sioux in Chicago has original tissues and proteins they've pulled out of it. They just didn't publish it. It's just 
it's ubiquitous. The more fossils you look at, the more we're finding original tissues. And they can't explain one of them. They come up with some lame excuses, but they don't have a good explanation. Even Jack Horner, who I dug with, and what, you know, he's an anti-creationist. He says, the creationists are going to love this stuff. And of course we do. Because this is as good a proof as you can get in geology. Geology is a forensic science. You can't go back in time and watch it happening, but you can keep finding stuff. You can keep looking at the rocks like I do, showing us a global flood. You can keep finding these original tissues, saying it was a recent flood. You see how they're tore apart? You know it's catastrophic. I don't have to give this talk. You guys can just pick up a newspaper or a scientific. You just got to read what they're not telling you is the implications that these are young. It was a global flood. It was catastrophic, and it was recent. Physical chemists will tell you they've studied these proteins. They've studied DNA. They've studied these things break down in thousands of years, not millions. Yet all of these are over millions of years old, many, many millions, if not almost a billion. But you might say in the back, well, but Tim, we've got so few. What's 100 papers? Although they find more every month. But here's some of the blood vessels they found, the red blood cells, blood vessels here. To me, it's like, that's kind of scary. They're finding stuff like they predicted in Jurassic Park. You don't need mosquitoes. It's already there. But don't worry, you need a dinosaur to put a dinosaur DNA back into to make a dinosaur, so we don't have to worry. But imagine you had enough tissue to fill a barrel, 42-gallon barrel. What about millions of barrels of original tissues and proteins? We have billions of barrels out there. You put it in your car. It's called petroleum. Petroleum comes from marine algae. Buried in the flood. Fast enough that it didn't decay. You've got to bury it fast. And they tell me when I work for Chevron that this oil in Wyoming is 150 million years old. It flowed across here in the Jurassic. And it's just sitting there waiting for us to drill. Everybody's like, oh, okay. And they think it works because they find it. But it works because it's young. It wouldn't be there if it's old. What happens to oil when we spill it? Bacteria eats it right up. Even in the ground, most of the oil we produce, over 70% of the oil we produce is biodegraded. Oil cannot be millions of years old. It's original organic compounds. You can look at the organic chemistry, which I forgot. Anybody take organic chemistry? If you don't use it, you lose it. It's like my calculus, but I know what a benzene ring looks like. So when you're putting gasoline in your car, the geologists are telling you that stuff's millions of years old in your brand new car. Who would put millions of year old gasoline in their car? You leave gasoline for five years in your garage, what happens to it? It doesn't run very well in your... Put it in your car. Don't try that at home. It's original organic compounds, billions and billions of barrels of original stuff, all buried in the flood. And there's enough biota out there today, if we buried everything alive today, we would have about... We only touch about 5% of the oil that's ever been found. So it isn't like you can't do this in a year's time. That's a, that was a secular study done in the 70s that shows there's more biota out there to explain all the world's oil about 20 times over. So if you really believe the oil is old and you frack the well, like they're doing now in West Texas, there should be no oil there. It should have been produced millions of years ago. So why are we still finding oil? You know, they don't really believe what they're saying. They don't think what they're saying. They find it because it's there, but it's only there because it's young. And they think I'm nuts. I'm like, are you thinking about what you're saying? You know, you go ahead and put your millions of years, I mean, try to imagine, here's, a, here's your homework for the night. Try to imagine maybe a thousand years. You can all imagine a thousand years. Try to imagine 10,000 years. That gets a little tougher. Try to imagine a million years. I don't think anybody here can. Maybe you're smarter than me. I can't. They throw these numbers around like they're real. They tell you they're real because of radioactive isotopes. That's another whole talk. But every, every radioactive isotope study that's ever been done on a known age volcano or lava flow has come in completely wrong. So when they know the answer, they never get the right answer. And yet you're told these are facts. These are real numbers. But they're fake. They're old because they need it to be old, 
to fit that evolutionary story Rainey talked about. If you don't have deep time, you don't have any chance for evolution to occur because we don't see it happening today. So hopefully in this talk I confirmed a little bit there's a lot of evidence out there of a global flood. The rocks are showing us, they're screaming out. The rocks are talking if you just go there and look for them. I'm just plotting up data. And it shows the evidence. Every continent does the same thing at the same time globally. Starts out low, minimal amounts, reaches the same peak all at the same time, and then goes down. And we see evidence in the fossils, in the rocks themselves, huge boulders, stuff transported and buried in the rocks, catastrophic conditions. And then finally, it was a recent flood because what we're finding in the bones, I think God is revealing this to us. In the times when things are getting bad, people are picking on Christians more and more, he's given us evidence to show that our word is true. You know, I'm just having the time of my life showing people that God's word is true. There really was a global flood. If we can just get that through to them. Because you know, almost every old earth person I know believes a local flood only. But the evidence is there. It's, it's a global flood. And it was catastrophic and it was recent. The evidence is there. It's just being ignored because it doesn't fit their story. We don't have to hide from the evidence. The evidence confirms our Bible. Confirms everything God wrote is true. In the back we have a book from my colleague John Morris, the son of the founder. He wrote this book, The Global Flood. I have a new book coming out that's going to be like part two to this. But he's updated this with some of my maps for the first three continents in this. And paperback is a little cheaper now. And he sets up what Omega Sequence is and explains a lot of these things and explains behind the, you know, try to, uh, kind of a layman's updated book of his dad's book, The Genesis Flood. And I kind of took it from there. And he's happy to say that my book doesn't really repeat a lot of what his said. It just kind of takes over and shows the geologic story of the global flood. And that should be coming up, hopefully by the end of the year. If you get in our acts and facts and sign up, you'll, you'll hear about it. And this is a little different version of the talk I just gave tonight that we have available to sell. And then here's the book I was talking about, my wife and I wrote, about these dinosaurs, uh, where God has plans for, not only for me, which I didn't realize until I was 52, but again, I wasn't 80. You know, Randy knew his plan. I didn't, I wasn't, I was clueless. I just didn't understand why these things were happening to me. You know, I guess I'll get a PhD, and if I didn't get that PhD, I never would have gone to ICR, and it, it goes on and on and on. Looking back, I see God's hand, even in my sinful nature. God was using me, and still uses me in my sinful nature, to do the things that he wants me to do and to show you that his word is true. And I'm just, you know, I'm just a guy. You know, God's using me. I didn't go to Princeton. I went to Western Michigan University, a little state school. Because I had a month when I got laid off to get back to school, and they, they knew me, so they took me in. You know, that's, I don't know, that's probably why I ended up there, but I see now it was God's hand. And all the way I was prepared. But this book talks about God has a plan even for the animals. And some of these animals end up on the ark. And you can tell male dinosaurs and female dinosaurs by the eyelashes. See, these <laughs> and sisters have eyelashes. You didn't know that, did you? It's not really quite true, but uh, we're going with it. And this book, unfortunately, didn't make the shipment. Uh, this is my dinosaur book that puts all, everything I know about dinosaurs in one book. I used to teach a college class. Uh, for years, introductory dinosaur class, and I tied it to the Bible. And at the end, I show some of my maps across North America to show that dinosaur peninsula, how they fit in. And then I went from there to the other continents. I didn't realize that same pattern was on every continent. And we could map out the world. We could map out the pre-flood world. You were some of the only people in the world to see that what the pre-flood world probably looked like based on real rocks. Because it fills in the low areas, and then the next area, the next area, and the fossils reflect those changes. And it it all, it's just logical sense. It's just someone's got to go through and put the time in. So I'm having a time of my life. This is, a, this is, you know, most people say this is a pretty good book. I don't know. I think it's the second greatest book ever written. But. <laughs> That's just my humble opinion. Even Randy likes the pictures. Right? Lots of great pictures. But if you get a chance to order this online, Will says he'll give you a discount card. You can save a little money on it. I think it, the list price is $24.99, but look that up. If you're really interested in dinosaurs, you want like a high school level book, but even young kids like these guys will love the pictures. There's a four-year-old that was mesmerized for two hours looking at the pictures. And knew all the names. I think I got it right. I hope. Now, this is the one book, if you don't buy any other book, and you leave here tonight going, these guys are crazy, but let me see what they have to say. I didn't write any of this. Notice my name's on the list. They wrote this the year I showed up at ICR. 
and this is the $10 book. Covers a little bit of everything. Covers biology, covers astronomy, covers geology, covers human chimp genome. All that's in this one little book. So I make my college students use a secular textbook on physical science, but we use this to supplement the lies and the secular humanism taught in these secular books. You need something like this. When I went to college, I had to use Henry Morris's books to get me through college. Everybody needs a little bit of a, a book or a crutch, or you're going to get caught up in that secular stuff. It's too easy to succumb to the secular lies. You need resources like this. That's it. All the scientists at ICR, all of us went to secular school. None of the staff got their PhDs at a Christian university. We all had to listen to the lies. But this is the stuff that got us through it. If you've got kids or grandkids going to college, they're going to need this. Maybe they're at a Christian school you know, now, but they're going to go to college. Most of the Christian colleges teach evolution as well. You need these resources. That's what got us all through. And that was $10. We're almost giving it away. Not quite. Well, shaking his head. Okay, we're not giving it away. But, and this is our picture outside. There's a DNA sculpture. We've got stegosaurs inside. We've got a full-size T-Rex that growls and roars. Our discovery center, they just opened up. When it cools off, I recommend coming down. Maybe another month. Uh, but it's quite an extravaganza. It's about $37 million facility. It has Grand Canyon. It has Mount St. Helens. It has a full-size mammoth that moves around. Anybody been down there? Anybody come for opening day up here? It's too hot. Okay, I understand. In another month, it'll be nice. You'll wish you were there about February. Come on down and visit us, maybe. Well, with that, thank you very much. <laughs>